well, boys. Looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom. My name is Eric, and I am here with Take Two, once more, with Feeling. Uh, my name is Eric, I am here with Michael, and we have a show that I believe is just for us, yep. and probably one of our listeners today. Mm-hmm. Uh, what are we doing on this grand, grand show of ours? We're going to do The Devil's Rejects and Halloween 2, two Rob Zombie films. Alright, so is this Halloween 2 or Halloween H? What the fuck is this movie called? Halloween H? No, we're going to call H2. it... Halloween H2. I didn't so complete the thought because I was mad. The title of the film went through a lot of a lot of incarnations. The original theatrical, when the teaser poster came out and it just kind of showed the mask... Um, that the studio decided to call it H two. Rob Zombie hated that. He wanted to call it what's it? The name of the book from the film, uh, which is the devil, the devil Walks Among yeah, Us. Right. And I guess they settled on Halloween two. With yeah, that seems like a good compromise. He wanted the Devil Walks Among Us. They wanted Halloween H two, and so they called it what H two Halloween two. Yeah. Okay. That's work. That doesn't work at all. That's terrible. Um, it's it's difficult because then I don't know how to tell people this is. I guess you call it Rob Zombie's Halloween two. Is yeah. that then people at least know sure. what you're talking about, right? Yep. So we could do a whole show trying to justify our love of Rob Zombie, but I fuck that. I think instead, um, you know what? Here, here's something that would be great because The Devil's Rejects is a film that even Rob Zombie fans, even people who don't like Rob Zombie, uh, acknowledge as an incredible film. And Halloween, that's a film that when I saw in theaters. I had trouble figuring out if I put it in the Rob Zombie camp or in the Halloween camp. I think people who listen to our Halloween Kill Palooza and our big Halloween fans might have the same kind of problem. So instead, I'm going to use this show for a uh, very selfish means, and I'm going to try and understand how to... I'm, tr- I'm going to just try and associate Halloween 2 with Rob Zombie yep. instead and see how that works. We have spoilers coming up for these movies. Uh, we are going to talk about the director's cut of Halloween, oh, too. which has a separate set of spoilers from the theatrical cut. And we're going to talk about the Devil's Rejects as well. People die in all over the place in both of these movies. There's a ton of spoilers. It's just a fun festival of death. <laughs> yeah, if you haven't seen the movies, use the chapters. And uh, we're going to do the Devil's Rejects first. So if you haven't seen it, skip on over to Halloween or H2 or what. God, and then they had H2O. So it makes the Halloween H2. Well, that was the even... point. That's where H2 oh, came Jesus, from. Jesus, terrible. Or just skip to the end of the film. Or maybe just shut the show off and skip back to Killapalooza uh, 5 or 4 or something where we talked about Halloween. Uh, why don't we do The Devil's Rejects first then? Great. So can I just say, you know, we might have covered this a little bit when we did House of a Thousand Corpses. That is the film that comes before mm-hmm. The Devil's Rejects. The Devil's Rejects is a fucking sequel. Yeah, it really is. Everyone says it's not a sequel, but it's the same characters. It picks up after the... It's a sequel, whether people like that or not. So, you know, what I like to do and what I like to think about The Devil's Rejects is I like to think that The Devil's Rejects is the film and House of a Thousand Corpses is the prequel. The prequel, sure, That's how I sure. like to look at it because it's kind of convoluted escapades of the same characters but the story isn't as solid and right. the characters aren't quite as built you and, mean house of a thousand corpses right and the uh the the direct i mean it's rob zombie's first film and yeah. it got butchered to hell and we yeah. talked about that back when we did that with sure, the Waco all that documentary. Stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah um but now we have the devil's rejects which is his first real film and a film that even rob zombie claims is not a sequel you're wrong <laughs> rob zombie's gonna write us hate mail i think the the big reason people say that is because one, it's very contained. It's very, very well done in that. Uh, and I think he might have known this as he was writing and shooting it. House of a Thousand Corpses was not seen by nearly as many people. It was not uh, nearly as successful as they had hoped it to be. So when they were doing Devil's Rejects, you know, there's that that thing that lingers in the back of your head where you say, "Well, not a lot of people actually saw the first one. Uh, let's do a story on the second that doesn't rely on you knowing information from the first. So you see the aftermath of the first movie in the opening scene. Right. There's that great scene where Tiny, and I love this about the film too, uh, Tiny is dragging, you get a full frontal shot of a nude corpse uh, right from the opening scene. And you get this idea about cannibalism and all these bodies. But the thing that separates The Devil's Rejects the most from House of a Thousand Corpses is not the fact that it's a separate movie, 
but that the movie itself contains a completely different tone and no cannibalism. Yeah, basically. in House of a Thousand Corpses, there's some weird kind of nods toward cannibalism. You never really see it. Yeah. House of a Thousand Corpses is a lot more geared to making you squirm. Yeah. The Devil's Rejects does that. It makes you feel uncomfortable, but it does it in a very realistic way and it's a lot less about heinous acts right and more about realistic acts done in a realistic way well the things that rob zombie writes about in the uh, titular song you know that's another thing i don't know if we've ever talked about this but he always does songs for his movies um he's been doing about one per album and the the devil's reject song i mean it talks about all of the necrophilia stuff Mm -hmm. and the cannibal stuff and all of these terrible things that the movie itself doesn't dwell on you're just supposed to know that these people there is something severely wrong with them and as long as you accept that they are complete psychopaths that's all you need to take from the first movie it doesn't it's not a required viewing in order to understand the road trip that you're about to go Mm -hmm. on with these people i think the movie itself does a fine job of telling you these people are unstable from pretty early on yeah never mind you know the whole opening scene with the raid on the house yeah which is terrific in itself. But by the time we get to the hotel room, uh, you know, the motel or whatever, they bust into that. And you have that scene where the two of them are arguing over the jacket on They're the They're bickering, TV. yeah, Buck Owens' jacket yeah. on TV. It's the moment in the film. Again, you get a little bit of it during the raid, but you don't really see it happen until the film kind of progresses. But it's the moment in the film where you realize that the Devil's Rejects, above and beyond all, are a family. Yeah. And they act like a family unit. In a in an almost nauseating way, the ice cream scene is yeah, another right. scene where a great one. It's it's Tootie almost fucking fruity. It's almost like they forgot that they've slaughtered a bunch of people, that they've yeah. skinned people and made their wives wear their faces, that they've blown Brian Posen's head right. wide fucking open, yeah. and well, instead they're just bickering over who gets ice cream. When we talked about funny games, that was one of the things we talked about. Is how mundane, I mean, if you're going to be, uh, I mean, we weren't talking about serial killers so much there, but just uh, the idea of a killer in general, someone who does it casually, it has to really be casual. So if they spent their off time in the truck talking about who they're going to kill next and how much fun it was and whatever, that doesn't give you, that's not as scary as people who can turn that off immediately and say, right. We want to go out for ice cream. So, yeah, I love this film. It's easily one of my favorite films. And when we did Natural Born Killers, I was saying, you know, the same fucking thing. Right, yeah. Reminded me a lot of that. Yeah, well, there's a lot of... Natural Born Killers is, you know, a married couple or, you know, I guess in their eyes, they're married. And they're going around killing people. But, you know, it's like fucking honeymoon vacation shit. Yeah, yeah. And in this, it's a family, which it just makes it scary because it's something we can identify with. And knowing that the entire family is going out killing people makes it a much scarier idea. Yeah, and as that scene in the motel room continues on and they're arguing over the jacket, it's not just that argument that uh, that family... I, I put yourself in the perspective of uh, Banjo and Sullivan, right. right? These are the normal people, the, the ones that the audience or most of the audience probably identifies with. Here's normal people, they have a hotel room and suddenly... You know, Baby and Otis bust in here and they're arguing over this jacket. But then Baby points the gun at Otis. I mean, this isn't a coherent force that's coming at you. This isn't a, even when we were looking at natural born killers, those people had it together a little bit more. They kind of had a plan. I mean, they were flying by the seat of their pants, but they kind of had a plan. They knew each other. Whereas these two could shoot one another. It's a at bickering a moment. brother and sister. Yeah. I, so you don't know what's coming. You don't know what their intentions are. And you don't know the best way to, I mean, at that point, it seems like they can't be reasoned with. And there's something about that that makes them really terrifying. As that motel room uh, scene continues, I mean, their roadie comes back and they shoot him in the face inches away from the right. rest of the people in that room. The situation just seems... You know, what would normally be helpful, more people come in the room, come to their aid. The situation just gets more and more grim for them to the point where, I mean, the only thing you could do is escape. And that's another fucked up scene, too. But we'll come back to that. I want to go back and talk about something else that separates this from uh, from the previous House of a Thousand Corpses. And that is the 70s kind of setting. I mean, you see that in the film technique. You see that, God, you see it in the grain. In that opening raid scene, that fucking relentless scene 
Uh, there's just destruction raining down mm-hmm. everywhere. There's a couple moments, specifically inside the house, where it is so you have uh, the light streaming in, and there's a lot of smoke and dust, and the frame is just littered with old school '70s grain. But then you have the soundtrack as well. Right, sure. I mean, the '70s stuff shows up uh, all throughout Rob Zombie's movies. Mostly Leonard Skinner or the Allman Brothers. Yeah, well, you have a lot of it here. It's any time you're not dealing with the score, you're dealing with. I said they're almost. Uh, it's almost a string of music videos right. of '70s. Sure. You know, music videos to '70s songs, especially the ending with fucking Freebird. Yeah, yeah. And then we have the freeze frames too. When you come out of that opening shootout, that opening raid. You start to, uh, it, it seems like they're introducing the characters with the right. credits. Um, they will show the characters getting away from the house, freeze on a frame and kind of zoom into it sure. a little bit. It just looks very seventies. And from there, you know, even the transitions you right. have, what is it? It's the, the, the wipes. side wipes. Yeah. yeah. Wipes that will often include, uh, different slides, photos, family of photos. The, yeah. It's really subtle though. I mean, it's one of the more subtle things that the movie does. You don't even realize because this would normally be a transition you're moving from one scene to another by freezing and just wiping the frame but then occasionally you'll throw in a uh, a family photo a kind of from a previous adventure that you didn't get to see and then go right back to a live frame the first time they do that maybe it's the second time they go back to a live frame that also moves back in the direction of the wipe just keeps everything feeling really fluid. One of those things that tells you that Rob Zombie really knows what he's doing right. behind a camera. Well, in another 70s thing, I mean, the cars, look at the cars. Yeah. Even though the film is not supposed to take place in the 1970s, there are no vehicles that have come after fucking right. 1985 yeah, yeah. in this film. And on top of that, no one's got a cell phone. Sure. No one's on the fucking internet. <laughs> right. The TV commercial, I mean, come on, local TV yeah, commercials. Yeah, it's almost public access it's, or something. Exactly, but that's the beauty of using the south is you can buy into this small town we're not really connected to the outside world mentality it's okay not to have a cell phone in the in the deep south sure well and that's part of i mean rob zombie uh, people say this about him all the time that he has this kind of hillbilly world but i think that's partially because the devil's rejects is just one of his more popular films especially before he started doing the halloween stuff which we'll get to uh i mean the devil's rejects you know is the most representative of of that setting you know what is it it's kind of trailer stuff poverty almost i mean characters that clearly aren't wealthy even for criminals uh they their cars are beat up and they're maybe not even beat up but dirty everyone is just dirty all the time it's not necessarily even that they're poor but they just do not give a fuck yep and then the house they live in is a shack like a den they live this kind of carnival existence they're always traveling yeah, they kind of have this home where they... It's essentially what, where they sleep. Yeah. And then every day they go out and rape and pillage and kill. <laughs> yeah. And do their fun everyday nomadic activities. And then they kind of come back to the home den. Right. And cuddle around, you know, whatever fucking leftover human scraps sure, they've sure. tied to their bed that night. Yeah, or sleep with the poor woman who's been tied to the bed uh, for a month, he right. said. Yeah. yeah. Busted that bitch wide open. You know, I haven't seen this movie in a long time. I've actually seen House of a Thousand Corpses more recently. Right. And when we talked about it on the show, and even if it didn't uh, make the stuff that aired, I know I've told you this before, that I enjoy House of a Thousand Corpses more. I think that's, you know, of Rob Zombie's stuff, that's one of my favorites. And, I mean, just after watching The Devil's Rejects, you have this this odd, um, the film persuades you to like it more. Sure. It it screams out, no, I'm the favorite. Yeah. And it's probably the better of the films. That seems to be the consensus anyways. But at the time, I remember really liking House of a Thousand Corpses. What I didn't remember about The Devil's Rejects is uh, maybe at the time I hadn't seen a lot of horror. Sure. This is only loosely in the yeah, horror genre. Yeah, I would definitely classify it more as a violent drama than right. I would a horror film. Right, and that's probably why I even saw it to begin with, because I wasn't watching any of the horror stuff. But I don't remember it being as funny as it is. Yeah. I think I was probably so uh, not put off by it, but I fell prey to exactly the world that this sure. movie had built. It was a hard world for me to be in, and I was always trying to run away from the characters rather than hang out with the characters. And now as I'm watching this, I mean, Sherry Moon is funny every time she's doing anything. Right. But uh, those scenes with Sid Haig. So we're going from the motel where the situation has gotten ridiculously bad, and it's gotten very perverse and sexual and violent. 
And then we're going from that back to... Sid Higgs stealing the car. Yeah, he's stealing a car. He's making clown jokes. I mean, all that stuff, stuff about how his clown activities... Excuse me, man, but I'll have to be taking your car today. You see, I have some top secret clown business that supersedes any plans you might have for this here vehicle. (laughs) Yeah, right. That stuff is really funny. But I guess even in the motel, even in the room, uh, they're almost playing good cop, bad cop. You know, as Otis is torturing these people... They just keep cutting back to Sherry Moon's character. They keep cutting back to Baby, and she's, uh, you know, she's blowing in the girl's ears. Yeah, she's playing with right. her hair. She's giggling. She is having a great time with this. Well, and I really like Otis. I think Bill Mosley is probably my the funniest part of the right. Ken Foray. Really funny yeah. in the film. Can't let well, him Ken down. Foray is doing Lando Calrissian yeah, in this movie, much. right? Yeah, I mean, he's absolutely. okay. So from the opening scene where they meet up with his character, I mean, the first time they uh-huh. meet. You have the same Empire Strikes Back. Sure. I'm going to ruin Empire Strikes Back yeah. for anyone who hasn't seen this scene. But uh, that scene where you think they're on bad terms, right. but then he squirts him with a wa- It's a sure. water pistol in Empire Strikes Back, right? Isn't that? Mm-hmm. That's not actually but what happens. I think Otis, But the betrayal, too. I mean, the betrayal happens. Just it, It's the same fucking thing. So what were you saying? That, I think that Otis is the funniest character in the film mm. because he's nuts. Serious funny, and though. He's, yeah, well, it's it's this kind of thing where he's crazy, he's the most dangerous one, and he's always, he's the driver. And yeah. I don't mean that in the literal sense, although he does do that's, his fair yeah, share of, as well. of piloting the vehicles. But he is the guy who's always, you know, business at hand, kill the fucking people, we don't get to have any fun. Right. But every once in a while, he has this moment of clarity where he gets these really fucked up, completely unnecessary things to say like oh gee hoss i hope your wife's pussy stink doesn't rust the barrel of my gun or the scene where baby is dancing in front of roy and he's all you're not getting any bad thoughts about my sister (laughs) here hoss why not you a queer yeah then then makes fun of him uh what's funny about a lot of his stuff is that he is saying humorous lines but completely straight face right as if he doesn't understand the humor and what he's saying whereas the other characters specifically baby are kind of the opposite. Sure. Their humor is is completely 180 from the, the stuff that makes his lines funny. If you're going to look at Rob Zombie as a writer, we've talked before about ways that he takes, especially horror cliches, but movie cliches in, in general, and uses them to his advantage. He one-ups them or he puts a certain spin on them. The thing I think he's doing here to create a movie that's a little bit different from House of a Thousand Corpses and a little bit more popular as a result is, uh, you know, if you go back to the slasher stuff where we, and this became more obvious as we went on by the time we got to Halloween, I think this was obvious, but even back when we talked about Jason, when you describe the Jason movies, you almost describe them as if, you know, our hero is on a boat to Manhattan. You talk about the slasher. I mean, that's what ties the franchise together. The slasher is your hero, not in a weird antagonist, protagonist flip around kind of way. But just, in, I mean, that's why you're showing up to the that's franchise. The one you, that's the guy you know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So by the time we got to the Halloween stuff on the show, we realized this, and we're just totally rooting for the slasher no matter what they're doing. Right. If you look back on all of our Killapalooza stuff, the stuff that angered us the most is when it turned out that our slasher wasn't actually a slasher, but a guy pretending to be him. I mean, would you agree with that? I think we were never more disappointed than those instances. All we ask is to see the same guy do the same shit for one more movie. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, right. That's basically it. That's basically it. And so in The Devil's Rejects, we are following around these three characters. We're capitalizing on that. You know, Rob Zombie is aware that they are our heroes. And so unlike a Friday the 13th movie, we're following around no names and just waiting for them to get knocked off. And once in a while, we see Jason. This is a movie where we are always hanging out with the devil's sure. rejects. We're always hanging out with somebody who's a little bit off and we want to see them do these completely fucked up things. Mm-hmm. You know, stuff like when Otis is mocking Adam, you know, t- when Adam tells him, fuck you, yeah. that's the triumphant slasher sure. thing, right? When you, when you really stick it to the slasher and mm-hmm. you say, you know, even if you're going out, you're, you're being stabbed to death there and it's your last line, you're going to go out honorably and you're going to say, fuck you slasher i'm better than you and whatever and otis mocks him yeah he wants him to know those words are meaningless there's no one here who's cheering for you there's nobody who's going to get behind what you're saying you're just going to fucking die here well, yeah. in a hill of sand and that's it for you he says look at you fucking hero you're yeah. gonna fucking bleed to death when we do get characters outside of the three 
or either dealing with the sheriff, the Elvis inspired sheriff, yes. who we can get to because I know you really want to talk about him, or we're still torturing people. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the woman running from the motel room uh, and then she gets nailed by the truck. That is a scene that for me will always stand out uh, about this movie. Mm-hmm. I will always think Devil's Rejects, a woman gets nailed by the truck. Right. It, you know, it's the one instance where you think, it's the first instance where you think someone is getting away from these characters. And, uh, you know, she has the face of her husband on her. It's this twisted scene. She finally gets out to the road and a truck hits her. And when the truck hits her, it pancakes her remains, a fucking Looney Tunes style, all over the pavement. There's no hope for any of these people. Right. They're all fucked. So we have, I guess, who would be called the protagonist, but he's dealing with shady characters. He's yeah. dealing with the unholy two. Right. He's right. called in these bounty hunters. Yeah, the unholy two are Danny Trejo and Diamond Dallas Page. Uh, which, by the way, just note for filmmakers, I don't know when this became acceptable. I blame uh, Jeremy Kasten for this, most likely. But uh, Danny Trejo should be the tallest motherfucking Mexican in your entire movie, second to maybe Antonio Banderas and Desperado, only because they call him the biggest right. fucking Mexican. But even in those movies, he lo- everybody looks huge in Rodriguez movies. But uh, Danny Trejo just needs to look fucking boss. You put him next to Diamond Dallas Page, this professional wrestler, who dwarfs him by, you know, two and a half feet. It's just always sad for me when I see Danny Trejo somewhere and he's not gigantic. So people need to take note of this. He's even smaller than William Forsythe in the film. Yeah, yeah he is. Uh, back to William Forsythe. So John Quincy Wydell, Sheriff John Quincy Wydell, is, I guess, if you're looking for a person to tack the title protagonist onto, he's a good person to do that to for the first 20 minutes of the film. Yeah, he's chasing the cannibals, I guess. That's so, about as much as uh, as you could say for that. Essentially, he has one of the most downturned character arcs it, easily in the film, mm-hmm. possibly that we've ever done on the show, where he starts off as this this small Ruggsville sheriff, yeah. and he keeps using the, the Johnny Cash phrase, you know, I'm trying to walk the line on yeah, this. Right. He's essentially trying to book these people based on the law. He's trying to catch them doing something illegal and really stick it to them. Sure. And essentially, he loses it. He sees it. He has a dream of his dead brother who tells him, you know, kill them, fuck walking the line. And yeah. he just... He snaps. He, he snaps. And he, he says the line later on in the film when he's doing the kind of the interrogation torture yeah. shit where he says... You know, I tried to walk the line, but now I see there is no line. We are playing on a level that most will never see. And then he starts stapling the pictures of the victims of this family of murderers to their chests. And the reason that I like this scene is because if if, if you haven't seen House of a Thousand Corpses, then this is a very easy thought experiment. But if you have, imagine the film franchise starts with The Devil's Rejects. And throughout the film, you get all of these news reports and news clippings and right. stories about women getting raped and murdered and tortured inside this house, this the house of a thousand corpses, right? right? But you never see any of it. Mm. And the only torture and rape and murder that you see is the once protagonist doing these horrifically violent and, and far over the top things sure. to this family of people that He's, he's defeated. They're beaten. Right. They are far and beyond Well, beaten. and in that very scene, he's trying to present you evidence to the contrary. Right. He's trying to say, here are the photos of all of the people who are eaten at this house. Here's the young teenage girl, the cheerleader who disappeared there. And here is, and I, all the while, he's trying to say, look at all the damage you've done. I will now staple the evidence to your body. Right. Uh, and then uh, drive nails through their hands. I mean, this is far beyond a point where this is revenge for him. Mm-hmm. This is probably past the point of even revenge. He has slipped into the same. Well, he's he's wielding the sword of God at this point, yeah. and he needs to he needs to make his blows true. Yeah, and and make sure that the devils feel the wrath of the Lord, which is one of the most hypocritical fucking things ever. <laughs> right. But the small town sheriff of the story is chasing the cannibals. That's what you have to do. Um, what I like about the torture interrogation is the aftermath of that, because at the point where he's pouring gasoline and lighting them on fire, you are no longer rooting for him. as a, You were probably never rooting for him as a character. But if someone were to ask you right now, if they walked in the room and said, oh, hey, what are you watching? Who's the good guy? Who's the bad guy? You would clearly identify him as the bad guy. Right. The people being burnt alive, they're the good guy, just by default, anytime you're burning people alive. 
um, the, the girl running away, you know, baby is now running away and he's taunting her. He's after her. He releases her only to chase her down. Like it's a right. game. And she's going through this maze. And at this point she's become what well, she's the scream queen. She's the of rabbit the story. He keeps yeah. calling her a rabbit, but yeah, she's the scream queen and he's become the slasher. He's going out of his way to find the most inhumane yep. method of, of killing her. She's our survivor girl. And we just want her to escape from this you know, unharmed. And that's when Tiny comes back. Um, So this moment that it, I guess it's a hamster style, right? That Tiny shows back up. I don't feel like you need to have seen House of a Thousand Corpses to recognize that character, Mm -hmm. but you kind of feel like that background helps, right? I think that if you've seen House of a Thousand Corpses, the one thing that it will help flesh out with the Devil's Rejects is where the fuck did this giant burned guy come from? Yeah. Okay. All right. But, I mean, you get him in the very... He's the one dragging you the full frontal nude corpse. You see a guy dragging a corpse. It could all very right. well be, you know, fucking Rufus, for all you know. You never yeah, see okay. his face. And so, although they all manage to get back out of the house, uh, that whole scene carries on just to give you one final run of... Classic road exploitation. Well, to try and convince you to get behind the family one sure. last time. It's one more shot at feel sympathetic for these characters, because in the next scene... They are going to get shot up, as you expect in any good road exploitation movie. They die driving. That's the way it's got to end. Live on the road, die on the road. I guess that is as much as we can say about The Devil's Rejects. Not at all, but it's as uh, much as we're going to say. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And of course, people can always go back and listen to the House of a Thousand Corpses show. But uh, we're going to do something a little weird. We're going to talk about this Halloween remake sequel. So this is weird for our show because we've pretty much ignored... Uh, almost as an art form, we have attempted to ignore the remakes, the reboots of these slasher right. franchises. So first off, let me apologize right now. When we did the Texas Chainsaw Killapalooza, mm-hmm. we did the remake and the prequel to the remake. I'm going to say right now that was probably a misstep on our part, especially seeing that we're going out of our way to ignore all of these other reboots. Well, you're talking about Texas Chainsaw Massacre. There's plenty of missteps there, so sure. we don't have to apologize to those But we're people. never going to cover Michael Bay's Friday the 13th, Yeah, and we're never going to cover Michael Bay's Nightmare on Elm Street. Anything Michael Bay does that has to do with slashers is probably not going to happen on this show. But we're going to cover Halloween 2, not as a part of the Halloween franchise. We've kind of, I think we're going to divorce ourselves from the remakes in and Killapaloozas. Let's try to do that. And instead let's take Halloween two as another Rob zombie film and another sequel to another film. So what's the biggest reason you feel we need to do that? Because we talked about Rob zombie. I mean, the real reason we talked about the Rob zombie film when we did the Halloween show is because back then we were just doing every single piece of all of these, right. you know, and that's still to to this day with the Killapaloozas, we've always done as much as has existed at the time of the show. Right. Uh, we chose to do Rob Zombie back then, and we thought that that was a wonderful way to reboot the franchise. Absolutely. I still agree. So different take here, right? I mean, Halloween 2 is probably not a wonderful way to continue the franchise. Yeah, it would probably be, in most circles, considered an immaculate betrayal sure. to the Halloween franchise. And let me tell you why. And I'm going to spoil the director's cut ending right here. All right. Rob Zombie, by the end of Halloween 2, kills all three major players in the Halloween franchise. Right. And he kills them fucking dead. <laughs> yeah. They are not coming he back. He tried last time, but that didn't work. Well, it turns out if you kill the slasher, the studio goes, great job, bring him back. Yeah, yeah. But if you kill the survivor girl and you kill your Ahab, There's it. nobody left. Yeah, he's discovered something from all of his research in slasher films. He's discovered something amazing. He's discovered that rather than try and do the final chapter over and over, which every, it's a joke at this point, mm-hmm. right? Every movie of a slasher franchise, even the reboots, are the final chapter of the saga. And then they just bring the, the iconic right. slasher back. You can't do that to the Survivor Girl. I mean, we saw it a little bit with Jamie Lee Curtis. But she kind of disappeared, and then she came back. Uh, She faked her death, or she went into hiding. I mean, that was acceptable there 10 years, 20 years later. Uh, It's not going to be acceptable in two years with, well, they have an out because they didn't use the director's cut in theaters. But when you've killed off Loomis, and you have killed off Lori, you're not going to accept them coming back quite as easily as you're gonna you will accept michael myers comes back sure. you can sever michael myers head and he comes back we've seen far worse yep. in let's say the friday the 13th yeah. movies 
Uh, you can Child's bl- play, really good Yes, example. <laughs> yeah. Um, you can always bring them back. You can't resurrect characters from the dead that were killed so blatantly right in front of you. That's just not going to happen. And I'm sure I'll be eating those words when the third Halloween comes out and that clearly happens. Or they could always just fucking reboot it anyways. Man, commerce ends all. You know, they will make money off these movies, so they will find a way to bring them back. It's just like when we talked about Halloween. I think I said it on that Killapalooza. You said, no way, man, never going to do a Halloween yeah. sequel. Because Rob Zombie said, no way, man, never yeah. going to do a Halloween sequel. And I told you, if there is a dollar, there is a way. And sure enough, they talked Rob Zombie into this. So this is why I think this movie came out so bizarrely. Uh, Rob Zombie, sometimes we talk about the reluctant hero. Rob Zombie is the reluctant director here. He is somebody who didn't really, I don't want to speak for him. I don't want to say he didn't want to do Halloween 2 because he did it. So ultimately something convinced and him. And he did a great job. We yeah, should he say certainly that right did. now. Yeah, I it's love It's a good this film. film. It's a great film. I understand when people who love Halloween say it bastardizes the franchise. Yeah, Because sure. that's actually kind of what I like about it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I do feel like it's a complete departure. And that's why I think you see that. Because he had to do this film, he had already done the Halloween story the way he thought it should be rebooted. This is the Halloween story if he just has to do another episode of Halloween. He's going to do something completely crazy and different than what he's done before because I don't think he's interested in doing the same movie over and over. Right. That's why House of a Thousand Corpses and Devil's Rejects are so different. Sure. Completely separate movies, even though it's the same characters. We don't just want to make House of a Thousand Corpses again. And here, he doesn't want to just make Halloween again. So we'll think about this just as a separate Rob Zombie movie, one that goes more in line with The Devil's Rejects than it does something like Halloween. However, I do want to talk about from a a slasher aspect a little bit. This opens with something we said would never work in a slasher franchise, Mm -hmm. and that's your character wakes up from a dream. Yeah. The whole opening of this movie is a dream, but you're all right with that this time. So I love it because one, Michael Myers was killed at point blank range from a high powered revolver. Sure. At the end of the first film. At the end of one of the four versions of the first film. Exactly. Or maybe several. I can't tell you how all four versions of that movie end because not even all four are available. So one of which the screener was never even released to people. So the first say, I, I guess it's probably the good 10 or 15 minutes of the film are in some way incorporated into Laurie's dream. Mm. But the reason I like this is because if you're going to bring back a slasher, make us figure out what of the dream was real, right? right? You see Michael Myers get out of the van. Okay. Yeah. You know, that might've happened, but at the same time, you know, you see Lori crawling over a pit of bodies. Right. That seems a little unlikely. Right. And eventually you realize that it's all been a dream and you get to pick and choose how much of that is a dream based on reality. You know, what actually happened that she's reliving through this dream? Sure. Or what actually happened. For example, she wasn't there yeah. for Michael Myers getting out of the van. So in her dream, she imagined that's how he got out of the van. Did that really happen? Maybe. But what probably didn't happen is, you know, him beating the shit out of this parking lot booth and killing Buddy. Yeah, because she hasn't actually seen him again. Right. Since that's a lot of what she's dealing with with her therapist. Uh, I feel like the dream is clever misdirection. It's meant to make you think you got an answer to how he was resurrected. Uh, But she wasn't there. She can't tell you the actual story. So rather than give you a story that doesn't involve her at all and you stay away from your main characters for 20 minutes, you get how she believes it probably happened. And you know what? As we've seen with these franchises, sometimes they just pull this stuff out of their asses. So it doesn't really matter, you know, if he bust out of the corner's van and the van lifted three inches as his weight left or if he turns out to be the second ambulance driver, or how they fucking resurrect him. He's back, and he's haunting Laurie again. And we're, instead, we're going to talk about uh, you know, Laurie's character, what him coming back means for her. Sure. I mean, that's, that's the big difference between the director's cut yeah. and the theatrical. Well, I think, I think the best way to put that is the theatrical version is Michael Myers stalks Laurie Strode for the second time. The director's cut version is best summed up Michael Myers finds Angel Myers. I think the best way to put it is less mask, more mommy, but go on. That's what the film is really saying. That's what the white horse thing is kind of all about. And normally, so this white horse thing, you're you're listening to Double Feature. My name's Michael. This is Eric. And Hello. we're about to tell you that we like the white <laughs> the horse The symbolic stuff. white horse, yeah. The white horse thing is essentially, it's explained in the beginning of the film with a wonderful little title card. Thank you, Rob Zombie. 
Same font, I think. I mean, yeah. I guess maybe not the same font from I don't know. Devil's Rejects. Our font specialist was uh, right. Uh, was not available right time. now. However, the white horse is there to symbolize this unity of the family, this having a, a thing in your past. For Michael Myers, it's his mother. It's this symbol of right. you know, all this stuff. And what I really like about the film is you don't realize it, but the entire purpose of the film is to rebuild the Myers family so they can all fucking die. Yeah, don't tell the studio, right? That's the right. that's the secret that the studio is not supposed to know. Uh, the White Horse also has some other symbolic meanings in broader culture, but we don't need to talk about unnecessary symbolism on this show. We don't like symbolism. Can, we just like it in this movie. Well, right? we've talked about symbolism where it works before. Sure. See Blue Velvet, that's uh, a great example. for example. But here, the White Horse, the only purpose it serves in the film, as far as this show can tell, as far as what we're concerned with, is uh, getting the family together, uniting the family. It's kind of an omen. It's a sign of significant change in uh, maybe not the family hierarchy, but just in the family getting closer together when they mm -hmm. reach uh, key moments in what's happening. So the big difference then is that she has this connection with Michael Myers, and that's in the original one. They just don't hammer it home mm -hmm. as much. In the, sorry, God, original. This is getting so complicated. In the theatrical version of Rob Zombie's Halloween 2, they have the same themes. They have the same fucking white horse, but they have uh, the same stuff where Sherry Moon shows up and, yeah. uh, you know, is the mom and. All the Rob Zombie music video stuff. Yeah, and that stuff is great too. I mean, the, my favorite one is when Lori's having her first freak out, and I think it's her in, in bathroom. her bathroom. Yeah, and I mean, the best one, the only one that I'm concerned with by comparison is the very end of that where she's in the glass, yeah, the glass coffin or whatever. And uh, it's just showing her resting there. And then she flips out. There's this tape sped sure. really fast. She it's is a just, standard horror movie technique. Sure. But if you couple it with Tyler Bates, yeah. it immediately becomes <laughs> yeah. one of the most scary base heavy things you've ever seen in your life. Yeah. When I make a call to uh, steal the Japanese horror techniques away from them and put them in our American films, that's uh, someone is delivering on that finally. And that person is Rob fucking zombie. But you glossed over what I was saying about the mask. I don't think you can get away with this. We have to, you and I, I mean, can't maybe Rob zombie gets away with it, yeah. but you and I do have to talk about it. One of the main reasons that people think this version is a, this film is a bastardization of the franchise is that you see, well, one, you see Michael Myers and two, Michael Myers just looks like Rob Zombie, right. but he's not wearing the mask almost throughout the entire movie. He's really only wearing the mask in, in the scenes where he is, he's killing in the, the director's cut. Right. You can tell once again in the theatrical cut, not only do you get an ending that is more friendly to future sequels, but you get a killer that looks a lot more sure. like the killer that you've seen uh, right. in the franchise up to this point. Now, again, me and you have criticized slasher franchises that try to remove the mask. Usually, we don't want to see that. Right. But once again, you're okay with that here. And why is that? I, we talked about the Angel Myers thing. This uh -huh. is kind of about Lori's coming to terms with her bloodline right. to go back to one of the more dubious of our <laughs> killapaloozas. Yeah. Bloodline. But... The thing that I like about seeing the mask is we're no longer worried about the shape in Halloween 2. Mm -hmm. The mask is the shape. That's what John Carpenter, you know, so That's titled his icon. Michael Myers is he's the shape who stalks at Lori. And drives a station wagon, right? Exactly. He's no, the we lost that icon too because it was stupid. But what I like about Rob Zombie's Halloween 2 here is that we're not worried about the shape anymore. We saw the shape wreak havoc last Halloween. Yeah. This Halloween, we're watching Michael Myers and Angel Myers, not The Shape and Lori. This is, it's an evolution in them as characters, which is a really interesting move for a slasher. And again, another movement away from the Halloween franchise, but that doesn't make this a bad film. It makes it a bad Halloween film. Mm. Does not make it a bad film. I think it might make it a bad Halloween film if it was not the last one. Right. If I think about this as the last Halloween film of all time... I like tearing down the character of Michael Myers. If you ever want to see what's behind the mask, you want to see it in the, well, you want to see it with Leslie Vernon. It's where you want to see it. But where you want to see it is in the last installment of the franchise. Sure. Finally, then we can see what's under the mask before we shoot the man dead and never see him again. Before we shoot Lori dead and never see and him again. And before we uh, stab Loomis, Loomis dead and never see him right, again. Right. Mask or no mask, that doesn't matter. This is still one of the most brutal Absolutely. Michael Myers. That's what we gave Rob Zombie a lot of credit for in the first one. But that comes back even more here. 
fucking relentless to the absolute nines. Uh, the the first scene in the dream that we see where he's killing the nurse. We get these medium shots of him raising the knife up and then these close-up shots of the wounds. You get to see, re- you know, the, usually when you do this in a, in a slasher film or just kills in horror movies in general, you either see far away or close. You see far away and it's ju- it's like an operating table. Sure. And that doesn't mean anything to you. It's kind of gross. And it's like when you see Lori on the table and they're pulling right. apart her thumbnails and Ugh. it's gross. Um, or you see far away with all of the, the real action um, or you get this newer third approach where the camera just flies around uh, on a couple rubber bands and you can't tell what the fuck yeah. is going on. But instead, we cut back to the faraway shots. We see the knife go all the way up. And as it plunges in, we get the instantaneous what the wound looks like as the knife is entering. What? Back and forth, back and forth. It just doesn't let and up. And on top of that, not only do we get the incredible fucking bloods like you hear the muscle <laughs> yeah. tissue separate yep. with yeah, the yeah. knife and then you hear the suction noise yep. when michael myers pulls the knife back out of the nurse i mean the sound of blood in halloween 2 is one of the most excruciating experiences and then there's this boss shot at the very end which you need in a michael myers movie more than you need with danny trejo even of michael myers standing over the nurse's body you know, feet spread apart, knife in the hand, just looking like a complete, brutal, scary person. But that's not the last one of these scenes you get. In fact, every time you see Michael Myers, there isn't any, uh, there's a couple quick deaths, I guess, but there are never any painless deaths. There are never any of this uh, stuff we get in other franchises where we say, you character, get out of the way. We're not concerned sure. with you. We're, we're trying to get the survivor girl. Here, every, every time somebody gets in the way, they are completely brutalized. Innocent bystanders, completely brutalized. Dogs eaten for yep. no reason in the director's cut of the film. I love that. Not just, you know, don't kill the pet, but now don't eat the pet is also the taboo <laughs> of horror cinema. I can't wait till we start doing that with the children, too. Sure. Uh, don't if, kill the children. Don't eat <laughs> don't the children. Don't eat the children, right. But when we get to the strip club, um, the strip club, I guess, from the first movie, right, yeah. where, his, uh, where his mom was working. That strip club employee that we get behind, who's just taking out the trash, he's not a Michael Myers way at all. Uh, this is something that's a lot different from the other installments of the franchise where we're going after Laurie or we're going after right. a character. Now Michael Myers is just at a strip club. It happens to be on his way to the party. And while people are in his way here, he's just going to absolutely destroy them. Why? Not because it's going after Lori, but because it's about the memory of his mother. Yep. It's about the family. That's what this film is about. Departure from the other stuff, it's about the family. So we're going to just hit up the strip club where his mom used to work on the way to the final events sure. of the film and kill the guy taking out the garbage. I got to make a stop on the way to the party. Right? <laughs> right, right. And so when he kills the guy taking out the garbage, we see the same sort of thing. He stomps on his face, bad enough, but he stomps on it again and again and again, the boot going into the face, it just doesn't stop. You know, he dies after three boot crushes, but we get maybe seven boot crushes sure. because that's just what you need to make sure and that this so target is out of the And he's so fucking proud that he hangs it in the hallway. This club will no longer be associated with Michael Myers' mother, sure. but instead the people who were crushed to death uh, at the club. The same kind of treatment is given to, to, the uh, yeah, to everybody in the club, yeah. really. Just complete carnage unleashed there. The movie brings a couple other things that um, different Halloween movies might have been afraid of. Captain Clegg being one of them. Right. Um, you saw them live, right? Yeah, they the were band. fantastic live. So how many songs are, are in here by the band? In the director's cut, I think there's four or okay, five. So, so this is a band that Rob Zombie found. Well, okay, and... so here's here's something really interesting and, and something that we mm-hmm. can really bring to the table as a, as a podcast of information about film here. So I don't know if you knew this, no. but Captain Clegg, the man Captain Clegg, has been doing music for Rob Zombie all over the place. In fact, Captain Clegg and the Night Creatures are also Banjo and Sullivan. Really? They're the same band. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. So also, um, so when we did Super Beast Stone, it ends with the Banjo yeah, and Sullivan yeah, dick yeah, soup. Yeah. That's actually <laughs> oh, Captain fantastic. Clegg. And so this also the same, um, I'm at home getting hammered while she's out getting nailed, yeah, yeah, another yeah. Banjo and Sullivan song. But Captain Clegg is just this group that Rob Zombie kind of morphs into whatever basic genre. <laughs> whatever he needs. And then they 
churn out a record. And Rob Zombie actually produces these records. You can buy them on Amazon. The Captain Clegg record is very good. Yeah, so I've heard. And the Banjo and Sullivan record is out. I mean, it's just, I really like the fact that this guy's just morphing. He's doing what he needs to do the music role. And so finally, not only does Rob Zombie put him and his band in the film, lets them play four songs, and then goes, hey, buddy, let's go on a fucking tour. Yeah, that whole scene from the concert moving away from other Halloween stuff, you have the great, great Rocky Horror Picture Show costumes yeah. there. Um, I'm actually a little bit disturbed by how spot on those I'm just are. turned on. They're man. really, <laughs> that's a little weird. No, that's the old Loomis. Also another good moment that I, if there was ever an obvious moment from this film that says, this isn't Halloween anymore. We're doing something different because we don't want to repeat that. It's when fucking Malcolm McDowell looks at the sign with the trench coat. We talked sure, about the trench, the coat, trench coat, coat on this very show. That was what we noticed Old Loomis has the trench coat, and even New Loomis had the trench coat in the last movie. That was just part of how you identified that character. And of course, Donald Pleasant's doing an incredible job in the old films. But now Loomis is, he's almost a throwaway character. He's a joke of a character yeah. at this point. He's not the hard hitter that he was, you know, saving the day before. He's now this guy who has sold out, sure. become a completely different character, and the movie lets you know that. And even when he comes back at the end to save the day, he does a pitiful job. The old Loomis could have done that job. New Loomis can't do the job. And that gets us back to this ending. So as we mentioned before, the ending of this film, in the in the theatrical version, the ending is completely different. So if you saw Halloween 2 in the theater, this is what you saw. Loomis goes into the shack, has kind of a tiff with Michael Myers. Michael Myers kills him. And then Laurie ends up over overpowering Michael Myers, stabbing him. And there's this weird scene where they're hugging mm -hmm. and you kind of realize, oh, maybe the family unit's finally coming together. And Michael Myers goes to grab the knife to kill Laurie. And Laurie says, no way, kills Michael Myers, wanders out with the mask on. And then Sheriff Brackett runs out, gives her a hug and whew, good thing Laurie's okay. And you still get the same, the horse ending too. Right. I have to say, I do like that ending as well because I always, something I always want in the movies until it happens where the, um, the person who's been chased, we saw that with Friday yeah. the 13th becomes the slasher right and then if they start to do too much of that in the next yeah. movie i always say you know what didn't want that yeah. never mind well another reason i like it is it just seems so clockwork orange the scene where they're in the malaco milk club and it shows that shot where it zooms in right. on alex's yeah. face and yeah, he's yeah, yeah. doing that look yeah and i mean rob zombie is no stranger to clockwork orange malcolm mcdowell is in the fucking movie not to mention the clockwork orange music video absolutely so to get back to this ending the director's cut ending is completely different. Michael Myers and Dr. Loomis stumble out of the wall, and there's this weird stabbing where Michael Myers stabs Loomis and almost kills him. I guess kills him. Mm -hmm. Then the police force unloads on Michael Myers and kills him. Laurie wanders out at the lead under the lead of Sherry Moon, of, yeah. of her mother. Yeah, we're getting some more of those surreal images of um, not the, the end horse stuff. That's completely different. But of them outside in this, uh, the floodlights coming right. through, and that's the same one we get. I think you can see that best when Michael Myers is lifting the car. Sure. I mean, that's a that's a real life thing, and not a um, a flash of his mother. Right. But you still have those floodlights coming through all right. of the fog, and the trees have kind of that that great color shift on them. I really love all the colorization uh -huh. of the stuff outside and of the light when it, when you can see it. Right. When the movie's right. not so dark, you have no idea what's right. happening outside. And so Lori picks up this knife at the end of the film, and she's about to kill Loomis, about to end you know, her surrogate father, as they say in the film. Yeah, yeah. So when I watch this, the director's cut, for the first time, never having seen this ending, you hear this first shot, and you see it. You see the squib go through Lori, and yeah. my jaw hit the floor. Yeah, you don't believe they've done that. Oh my god, Rob Zombie's killing Lori Strode. Yeah. And in my head, I went back and I remembered this. This is the only, I think, the second or third time I've seen this director's cut. But I remember Lori getting shot 5,000 times. Yeah, yeah. She gets shot three times. Right. But in my head, she, her, her body was replaced by bullet Riddled casings, with bullets, sure. And then she dies. All three of the Halloween characters lay dead on the ground. And there's this wonderful zoom in on Laurie's body while Nan Vernon's Love Hurts kind of comes right. over. Which is a really cool reference to the first film. Because Love Hurts was the music that played when Michael Myers' mom first left to go to the strip club. And he went and killed everybody. And so ends the Halloween franchise until they churn out another one. If Rob Zombie's behind it, we will talk about it. That's right. And, uh, you know, maybe if it's good, we'll talk about it. But I wouldn't have high hopes for that. 
Um, as far as I'm concerned, here's another excellent movie to add to your Rob Zombie library. So all of those people we alienated by doing our own little Rob Zombie show here, those people can all come back and listen to next week. Right. In the meantime, we have a website, doublefeatureshow.com, and an email address, doublefeatureshow at gmail.com. Normally, that would be the email address where you could send us an email saying, please don't cover Rob Zombie on the show anymore. But actually, a piece of surprising news for people who might not uh-huh. know uh, Rob Zombie's work we're done. We've done everything. We've done everything he's done. We even El Super Bisto. Yep. I mean, this is literally until we start doing uh maybe on double sleepy nap time we can do his comic book. Sure. But Or double uh, stupid crime show. <laughs> yeah. Oh my god. You and I both I won't even I guess it's CSI, right? We need to Rob Zombie did an episode of CSI and we actually watched it. That's just how much we enjoy that. Fuck set. you, CSI. Oh god, CSI is so terrible. Anyways, uh, what are we doing on the show next time? Next time we're going to do The Last Man on Earth starring Vincent Price and Deliverance. There's a lot of themes that kind of bring those two movies yep. together, but that's uh, that's something we will definitely hit on on the show when we do it. I'm fucking pumped. Watch more fucking film. Bye.